before I really get into our word today, I, I want to I share something with you that I think is going to eliminate some confusion when it comes to trust and when it comes to love and particularly what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There's a young lady who asked a question last week, and sometimes I, I, I wish I would think in those moments, you know, when you're answering those questions in those moments, you're doing so on the spot, and I just really wish that I've given some thought to the fact that she said that she was a first-time visitor, which means there are things that I have taught in the past that she has not been privy to and that I shouldn't have, or at least that I should have thought about in regard to my answer so that I could have given an answer that I think would have been much more complete. So I want to share this with you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, or one of the things it says about love is love always trusts. Are you familiar with that? Okay, so we're in the midst of a series now where we're talking about trust, and most specifically, we're talking about trustworthiness. How can we determine and discern and assess who is trustworthy? How can we ourselves be trustworthy? However, I think one of the challenges with the English language, unlike the Greek language, is that we have one word for love, and that one word is used to describe all of the variations of love. Whereas in Greek, you have several words for love, and each of those words has a distinct definition that helps us to understand the type of love involved. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the word love in Greek is agape. It is the God kind of love. I did share that with this young lady last week. But here's what we need to recognize. Eros the Greek word for the romantic kind of love, the kind of love my wife and I share, that's one thing. Phileo, which is the Greek word for brotherly love, the kind of love you share with a friend or a brother in Christ or something along those lines, that's another type of love. And there is even another Greek word for love that we don't use often because it's only in the Bible maybe two or three times, and that is storge, which is a fam familial type of love, the kind of love that a parent and a child share together. So here's what I need you to understand. When 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says love always trusts, it doesn't say eros always trusts. It doesn't say phileo always trusts. And it doesn't say storge always trusts. It says agape always trusts. Does that make sense? So let's also look at it in the context of the scripture itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what they are, who they come from. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is how you use those gifts in a gathering, in a service. So why did the Holy Spirit lead the Apostle Paul to discuss love right in between the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what they are, where they come from, and how you utilize them in service? Well, it's right in the beginning of what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, look, if, he says, if I uh, uh, can speak in the language of angels or of all men, but have not love, I am just a clanging symbol. He says, look, if I can prophesy and give all knowledge, have all wisdom, but I don't have love, I am nothing. He says, if I give away everything I have and I submit my body to hardship, but I have not love, I've done nothing. And his point is that agape, when you work in and operate in the gift because of agape love, the God kind of love, that it should be because of the love that you have that spurns the utilization of that gift amongst your brothers in Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, let's make it, let's put it all together now. So for instance, let's say that you have a relationship with somebody, whether it's a relationship where there's arrows, whether it's a relationship, whether it's with phileo, whether it's a relationship where you have storge, but you don't have trust. But you have a prophetic gift and the Lord gives you a word for the person you don't trust. Well, your eros, your phileo, or your storge has nothing to do with whether or not you should give that word. Agape compels you to give the word, right? 
And because it's a God kind of love, if the word is somehow betraying, of, if there's a betrayal of trust concerning that word, that's not between you and them. That's between them and God. So that your agape love can always trust and never be threatened because it's a God kind of love. Does that make sense? All right. So then that means we're clear now on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love always trusts. It's not eros, not phileo, and not storge, but it's agape. And with that love, you can always trust and you can always hope. You're not under any threat in those instances because, again, we're talking about you being used by the Spirit of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the gifts that the Holy Spirit uses through you to minister to a brother or sister or any individual that's in your life. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. Let's look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. All right, so I'm going to read this whole entire psalm. So I'm going to need you to rock with me for a minute. This is, this is probably the longest scripture I've ever read and one time uh, in the house of God. But I just need you to stick with me as we read through it. And by the end of it, I'm going to share some understanding with you that's going to lead to our discussion today about trust. So Psalm 139, and this is a psalm that is written by David, King David. All of you, who, all of you know who David, the slayer of Goliath is. This psalm is written by David himself, and it says this. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you, you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is light for you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, God, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was in my secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All of the days ordained for me were written in your book. Before one of them came to be, how precious to me are your thoughts, God, how vast in the sum of them, where I, were I to count them, I, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. <sighs> Jesus. <sighs> that, that last phrase, that, that last half of the last sentence Lead me in the way everlasting. Some versions say, lead me in the way of everlasting life. I want you to think about what David is saying in this last part of this phrase, where he's saying, lead me in the way everlasting. I want you to think about the fact that you only follow those you trust. You don't follow anyone 
who you do not trust. And here David is saying, not just lead me, Lord, (laughs) but lead me into life everlasting. So I want you to consider David's thought process. Because, see, there are a number of reasons why we trust God. We trust God because he's all-powerful. He's our fortress. He's our shield. We trust him also because he has done great and amazing things before, so we know he can do great and amazing things again. We trust him because of his character, because he's righteous. But David didn't mention any of those things. He didn't mention not one of those things as he was sharing these thoughts of the Lord. But ends with, I want you to lead me to life everlasting. He ends with, I trust you to the degree I want to follow you if you'll lead me to everlasting life. He does tell us, though, in the text why he trusts God, and this is what we need to recognize. He trusts God because God knows him. He trusts God because God understands him. He says, God, (laughs) he says, God, you know the words that are going to come off my tongue before I speak them. You knew all of the days of my life before I lived even one of them. You saw me in the secret place as I was in the womb where you knit me and formed me together. David's thought process is, nobody knows me like you. And because you know me, I trust you. See, as we're talking about these essentials of trust, the first essential of trust is understanding. When you feel like somebody understands, you trust. Um, Do you know that a lot of businesses have, have come to recognize this. They have a section or, or they have um, some principles in customer service today that they call customer service empathy. Have you ever noticed that you might call your phone carrier or your cable provider or whatever you got going, you'll call them and you say, hey, I got a problem, and then they'll say to you, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I know that can be frustrating. Let me see how I can help you. They do that because they've learned that empathy causes trust. They've learned that if they can get you to feel like they understand your issues, that you'll trust them. Because understanding is crucial to trust. Remember, we said that trust is feeling like what you value is safe in the hands of another. So that means that you want to feel like what you, that the person you might want to entrust something to understands what you value, that they understand why you value it, and that they understand what's necessary to safeguard what you value. If you don't feel that, you don't trust. Let me give you a more practical, uh, more practical example of that. Um, some of you in here, you don't have children, but just imagine with me. But let's say, for instance, you, you have a child, and you and your spouse have recognized that sugar can be dangerous, especially later on in life. You've learned that sugar is connected to cancer, that sugar is connected to dementia, especially Alzheimer's, that sugar is connected to a number of diseases, and ultimately that it's addictive. So you and your spouse have decided no sugar in our child's life. This is what you've decided. Poor child. Okay. Now, you and your spouse also have to work. So what you guys decide, and and, and you're able to do this financially, is you're going to hire a nanny to stay with your child during the day. 
Now, you have two nannies set up for interviews. And each of those nannies comes. You share this concept with each nanny. Look, we realize how dangerous sugar is, especially later on in life and its connection to diseases, and that it's highly addictive. So we want to ensure that you don't give our child any sugar. All right? Interviewee number one says, no problem. No problem. Interviewee number two says, oh, I wish my parents would have done that. When I learned how dangerous sugar was, it took me a while to break that addiction, but I'm glad I did. Who do you trust more? Number two. See, it's not like number one said, no, I'm not doing it. Number one said, no problem, and undoubtedly would likely do it. They're getting paid to do it. But number two seems to understand. Why? Because the understanding means that you perhaps share a conviction and a value around that thing. And see, you trust that their conviction will be a part of how they function. See, look, it's one thing for somebody to do what you want them to do. It's another thing for them to understand. Because there are people who, if you don't trust them, will try to convince you, well, I do everything you ask. Ah, but that doesn't mean you understand. And generally, let me be clear, generally, people who will do what you ask but don't understand, they will do what you ask until it's no longer convenient for them. Or until there is no need to no longer do what you ask. But someone who understands, there's a deeper conviction for them to what you're entrusting to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah, see, this is, this is one of the reasons why I'm going to repeat this. And I said it last week. You cannot allow anyone to convince you to trust them. Trust is never accomplished by persuasion. In fact, sometimes the more somebody attempts to persuade, the, Lord, the more you distrust. <laughs> Not only that, do you know, being right doesn't gain trust. Ah, being right doesn't gain trust. Let me give you a scenario. Oh, Lord, I, I, I wasn't going to do this one, but I figured I would do, I have to anyway. All right, let's say, for instance, you have a husband who has an ex-girlfriend. Oh, see, stop playing. <laughs> All right, sit, not here. Say so you have a husband who's got an ex-girlfriend. Ex-girlfriend says, calls him up. I have nobody else. I'm moving today. Can you come and move this couch for me? Husband says, I'll come. Husband calls Cousin Pookie, Cousin Peanut, and they go, and they move the couch. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. That's it. Okay? Husband comes home. Wife says, where you been? Husband said, I went to so-and-so's house to help move a couch. Wife goes, what? What? Say what now? <laughs> She's got a problem. So what does the husband do? He persuades. What, what's the problem? I was only there 10 minutes. I took Pookie and Peanut with me. Nothing happened. He tries to prove that it was right to do it. Girl, you know I'm a Christian. She needed help. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Listen, husband, don't come looking for me. <laughs> The wife doesn't feel better about any of that. Persuading her and trying to talk logic and reason about how much time it took, who went with you, nothing happened. That's not going to make her feel better. And you claiming that you did it because you're a Christian, forget about it. That's not going to make her feel better. But you know what would make her feel better? To say, well, tell me why do you feel that way? And then for the husband to say, hmm, I understand that. And then to have actions after that show that there's a real understanding about what she feels. That garners trust. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. See, you actually see this. Um, you ever watch a TV show or a movie where somebody's taking a hostage and you have a hostage negotiator show up, right? The hostage negotiator doesn't persuade. They don't say, hey, you know what? You, you know you're going to jail <laughs> when this is done, right? He knows that. That's why he's in there with the hostage in the first place. You're not telling them something he don't know. And he doesn't also, and he doesn't, the hostage negotiator also doesn't try to be right. Hey, you know what would be right to do is for you to let those hostages go. Drop your gun. Come on out. He knows that's right too. What does the hostage negotiator do? Tries to empathize. Tries to find out the person's name. Well, his name is John. Well, let's get him on the phone. John, what led us here today? It's true. Look, I, I've read, I read about hostage negotiating techniques and what hostage negotiators trainers, they, they want you to say, hey, what, what brought us here today? I, I want to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Do you know that you can show understanding even when someone is not in the right? This is, this is, this, listen, you need to know this. You can show understanding even when someone is in the wrong. You can show understanding even when people are in sin. Jesus does it. I'm going to prove it to you. Let's take a look at Hebrews. Let's take a look at this passage in Hebrews 4 and 15. I want you to see this. This is unbelievable. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let me show it to you from a different version. This version is really powerful. I love the way it says this. It says Jesus understands every weakness of ours because he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. See, you can understand even when someone's in the wrong. And one of the primary reasons you can understand when people are in the wrong is because you're tempted to be in the wrong. Like, just think about this for a moment. This is, this is a horrible example, but it's just so real. Anytime that you've seen someone commit a heinous act as a result of road rage, you might say to yourself, that was crazy. That was dumb, but at the same time, you know that you've been in situations where you would be tempted to do the same. It's just you exercise a different degree of self-control. You got a little more Holy Ghost in you than some others, but you were tempted nonetheless. So what does that mean? It means that someone who has done wrong in that way, you can say, I understand how you felt that drove you to that. And if you can understand, you can garner trust. Yeah. Understanding. I need you to recognize if you're going to trust someone, you want to assess their understanding of what you value. If trust is feeling that something you value is safe in the hands of another, do they understand what you value? Do they understand why you value it? Do they understand what's necessary to safeguard what you value? I, <clears throat> If you're a business owner, if you're a manager, if you're a supervisor, all of the responsibilities that fall to you are valuable. But often the way a business works, whether you're an owner, a manager, or a supervisor, is that there are things that are entrusted to those who are below you in some way. What you want to know is, 
do they understand the value of what's been entrusted to me as I entrust a portion of it to them? This is what interviews are for and resumes so that you can assess whether or not this person has the capability to safeguard what you want to trust to them. Now, I want to hearken back to something I shared with you last week. And believe it or not, I'm almost done. This is the fastest sermon you've ever experienced. But let's wait till I'm finished to really figure if that's going to be true. Um, <laughs> I want to hearken back to something I said last week. I said, I want you to resist the temptation to just think about this message series on trust from a context of those who you currently don't trust or those you're considering trusting, but you also have to determine whether or not you are trustworthy. So I want to go back to Jesus because in that first sermon last week, I showed you that there were four degrees of Jesus' trust. Jesus had some people who were following him who he didn't trust at all. Then he had 72 who were following him who he entrusted or trusted some responsibility, some tasks to them. Then he had 12, I'm all over the place with my hands, okay, 12 who he entrusted information to. And then he had three who he entrusted who he really was and what he was really feeling. Before I go any further about where we are in that, I want to point this out to you because I think this will also help you as you assess who you trust. Jesus is the primary example of all that we should do. And I want you to recognize that as Jesus had four different degrees of trust, he also had four areas of trust. So he had those who he didn't trust anything to. That's one area. And then he had some who he could trust with tasks. Then he had some who he could trust with information. And then he had some who he could trust with himself. So listen, you may have some people in your sphere who you can trust tasks to, but not information. You may have people who you can trust some information to, but not information about yourself. Does that make sense? And you have to discern who you can trust in which ways. This is why we're talking about these essentials of trust. But then I need you to also think about this. If Jesus has those who he trusts at, not, doesn't trust at all, and then he has some who he entrust, can trust with some tasks, then he's got some who he can trust with some information, and then he's got some that he can trust revealing himself to. Which one of those are you? What can he trust you with? Has he not shared anything with you? Because he doesn't feel like he can. Has he given you a task but he doesn't necessarily give you a lot of information. Has he given you some information, but you still feel like, man, I really haven't seen him. And as you assess that, I want you to think about this. Have you shown Jesus that you understand what is most valuable to him? Can we talk about two things that are valuable to him? Just two, these are the top two, top two. Jesus values the lost. He values them so much, he died. He values the lost so much that he suffered and died. He values them so much that he allowed people to pull the skin off of his body. He values the lost so much that he allowed people to punch him in the face. He's the son of the living God. He could rain fire down on everybody and call it a day. But he values the loss so much that he let them put a crown of thorns on his head and then beat him in the head with a staff. He values the loss so much that he allowed these people to nail him to a cross where he would later asphyxiate 
as the weight of his body crushed his chest. And he knew it was all coming in the first place. So he values the lost that much. The second thing he values is he values his sheep. He values the sheep so much that he said, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. But he didn't end the conversation there. He said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. He said, you love me? Feed my sheep. But he didn't stop there. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, Jesus, this is the third time. And he wasn't blaspheming. He's talking to Jesus. Jesus, this is the third time. Yes, I love you. Care for my sheep. He loves his sheep so much that he put the sheep in the hands of those who claim to love him. So then the question is, do you feel like your life following Jesus has shown that you have some understanding of what he values? Have you walked in your life with Jesus in a way that shows that you would help safeguard what is valuable to Jesus? If you remember in John chapter 10, Jesus revealed something interesting as he was talking about how he is the good shepherd. He said, well, look, the hired hand is not the owner of the sheep, nor is he the shepherd. So when the wolf comes, the hired hand runs because he doesn't care for the sheep. See, that's somebody right there you can't really trust the sheep to because, see, they don't understand what you value the way that you do. The hired hand doesn't value the sheep the way the owner does. The hired hand doesn't value the sheep the way the shepherd does. The hired hand runs when trouble comes because he's like, see, that's not, that's not for me. Jesus then says, but I'm the good shepherd. Here's what he says. He says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I understand them. They understand me, so I lay my life down for my sheep. In the kingdom, how are you dealing with the sheep? Are you like a hired hand? Do you not really care for the sheep? I realize that in our current Christian dispensation, Everything in church is all about us. Some of you came to get your blessing today. <laughs> Some of you came because you needed it. But might there be some of you who came because you thought, if I go today, maybe I could pray for someone. If I go today, Maybe I end up in a conversation with someone who I could encourage with how God has moved in my life. See, do you show Jesus, have you shown him that you value what he values? Because ultimately, I want him to trust me. I want him to trust me with tasks. <laughs> I'll do whatever I need to do for you, Lord. I want him to trust me with information. Teach me, God. I'll do right with the words you teach and with the truth you teach. I won't be afraid of the world because they don't agree with you. I won't be afraid to stand for your truths because the world is going a different direction. You can trust me with the information. And Jesus, ultimately, I want you to be able to share with me who you really are. I want to be able to be in a moment of prayer and really experience you. I want to be in a moment like those Korean missionaries who were taken hostage by the Taliban, who were separated and put into pits, who were later freed and went home and said, I miss the Jesus I knew in the pit. See, as we talk about trust, I believe that the Holy Spirit is truly leading us to learn how to discern who we can trust. 
so that we can experience a sense of peace that allows us to move forward because we have people around us who we trust. But I think he also wants us to recognize whether or not God can trust us. I think the Holy Spirit also wants us to be assessing whether or not we are those who God trusts. I think it's hard to, 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 to do that reflection. It's, it can be difficult, I understand. And um, I think as we think about that, there are some hard truths that we have to consider. I'm going to be honest with you. As I looked at those four things, I don't, I don't know if I'm in that last category, those who Jesus feels that he could show himself to. I don't know if I've seen him like that. I know that he's trusted me with information. I know that he's trusted me with tasks. I'm confident I'm not in the number that's not trusted at all, but I'm not so confident I'm in that number like the three where he could trust me with who he is, what he really feels. In some ways, maybe, but since I'm not totally sure, then I'm convinced not all, not all the way. Um, we should be honest about it. And I think that we should find a place where if we recognize where we are, that we're honest and we repent. And we say to God, I want you to be able to trust me. What do I need to do? And begin to line up our lives. Remember, like the husband, help me understand. And now I'm going to do what's necessary to show you that I understand.